good afternoon or good evening, uh, everybody. Uh, this is the start of the second session of this month for the Arrhythmia uh, webinar, uh, again organized by the Netherlands Society of Cardiology. We do apologize for the technical issues that happened last week, including the uh, bad audio, unfortunately, that we had last week. Uh, but uh, the company, uh, thanks to you guys, uh, fixed the problem. And as you might have noticed, the uh, sound system is uh, improved and uh, uh, things are uh, more aligned uh, this week. So this week we have our first speaker, Dr. Tony uh, Abboud, our friend director of physiologist at uh, St. George uh, Hospital. Uh, he will be discussing with us a uh, case-based uh, approach to uh, brady cardiac cases, uh, particularly heart block and uh, sinus dysfunction. Thank you, Bernard. So uh, we'll be talking uh, about uh, evaluation of bradycardia and syncope. And uh, we will take uh, the example of uh, a 70 year old uh, male patient presenting for syncope with a heart rate of 40. As you can see on the EKG, he has uh, simply sinus bradycardia uh, with normal AV conduction. So every P wave is followed by a QRS, but with a slow heart rate of 40. And uh, to discuss this case, we will be uh, uh, using mainly the last uh, guidelines of the, the European Society of Cardiology about the diagnosis and management of uh, syncope. 2018. So first, the definition of uh, syncope. Syncope is a total loss of consciousness due to transient global cerebral hypoperfusion, characterized by rapid onset, short duration, and spontaneous complete recovery. Uh, when we talk about the total loss of consciousness, uh, first we should differentiate non-traumatic from traumatic uh, loss of consciousness. We'll be focusing about uh, on non-traumatic total loss of consciousness uh, and mainly about syncope. We have other causes of uh, total loss of consciousness like epileptic seizure, psychogenic and rare causes like uh, subclavian steel syndrome, vertebrobasilar TIA, subarachnoid bleed and cyanotic breath hold spell. But we'll be focusing mainly at the fir first part uh, syncope, mainly the three main categories of syncope, the reflex syncope, the orthostatic hypotension, and the pure cardiac causes of syncope, arrhythmia, and others. Uh, first, uh, the reflex syncope is divided mainly into vasovagal reaction, can be orthostatic, vasovagal syncope, mainly in standing position, less common sitting, or emotional, uh, if you have uh, in the context of fear, pain, instrumentation, or, uh, or uh, blood phobia. Then you have another frequent at the age of uh, this man, the, our 70-year-old uh, man, situational syn syncope, uh, in micturition, gastrointestinal stimulation, swallowing, defecation, cough, sneeze, post-exercise, or others, uh, laughing, and others. So in our interrogation, we, saw that we should ask our patient about all these things. Then we have another reflex syncope due to carotid sinus uh, hypersensitivity and other non-classical forms. So all these are called reflex syncope. Then we have also at this age a frequent cause of syncope, secondary to orthostatic hypotension. So in our interrogation, we should ask, ask about the drug-induced orthostatic hypotension, vasodilators, diuretics, phenothiazine, antidepressant, volume depletion, bleeding, diarrhea, vomiting. Then primary and secondary autonomic failure. Uh, the primary, like pure autonomic failure, multiple system atrophy, Parkinson's disease, dementia with Lewy bodies. 
Then the secondary causes like diabetes, amyloidosis, spinal cord injury, autoimmune neuropathy, paraneoplastic neuropathy, and kidney failure. So also our patient and this age should, should be interrogated because all these are possible causes of his syncope. The third part, uh, and we will be focusing mainly uh, on this part, cardiac causes of syncope. First, the arrhythmia. It can be secondary to bradycardia, to tachycardia, structural cardiac disease, cardiopulmonary and great vessels. Bradycardia mainly divided into sinus node dysfunction and atrioventricular conduction system disease. The tachycardia can be supraventricular and ventricular. Then other structural cardiac diseases, aortic stenosis, myocardial infarction, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, pericardial disease, tamponade, congenital anomalies, prostatic valve dysfunction. So all these can cause syncope. Uh, in the, concerning the conduction system, it's divided on abnormalities at the level of the sinus, sinoatrial node and abnormalities of the AV conduction system. Sinoatrial uh, disease can cause multiple, cause, uh, multiple uh, abnormalities, like sinus tachycardia, sinus bradycardia, sinus arrhythmia, which is physiologic mainly, sinoatrial exit block, sinus poses, and the sick sinus syndrome. So at, uh, in this patient, we had the, the EKG. He had sinus bradycardia, like we saw, at uh, uh, 40 beat per minute. It's frequent at his age. We should look for a cause of his sinus bradycardia. Is it secondary to medications that can be reversible? Uh, to ischemia, uh, to uh, other diseases. So we should uh, do our, uh, our full interrogation to be able to diagnose the cause of the sinus bradycardia. Because we have other etiologies that can cause uh, syncope at this age, like sinus poses. Sinus pose, you will have the absence of a P wave. It can be prolonged for a few uh, to multiple seconds. And also, it is uh, associated uh, with the, uh, at this age with the uh, sinoatrial node disease. It can be secondary to ischemia, to medications like beta blocker, digoxin, uh, electrolyte disturbances, and the uh, other diseases of the sinoatrial node. We have also uh, another uh, sinoatrial problem, which is the sinoatrial, uh, sinoatrial exit block. At this time on the EKG, uh, you will see that the PP interval during the pause is a multiple of the PP interval in normal sinus rhythm. So also this one can cause uh, uh, syncope. Uh, another frequent cause of syncope at this age, the sick sinus syndrome or the tachycardia bradycardia syndrome, you will see alternation between uh, episodes of tachycardia, like atrial tachycardia or atrial fibrillation, alternating with pause. So this is also, at this age of our patient, is a frequent uh, cause of syncope. Then we have the hypersensitive carotid. It's considered one of the reflex tachycardia. It can be diagnosed by uh, carotid sinus massage when you do it and uh, recording at the same time you will see a significant sinus pose associated with uh, symptoms, uh, syncope or lightheadedness and uh, hypotension at the same time. Then we have the AV conduction problem. I might stop you here uh, yeah. for a second. Regarding the hypersensitive carotid and the carotid massage, a lot of people uh, don't know how much pressure should be put on the neck. Because, you know, if you strangulate someone, definitely. Yeah, he will die. <laughs> so, uh, uh, what's the best way of doing this maneuver? So, it, uh, you should simulate a physiologic condition. So, it, you should simulate a pressure that can happen in real life. You should not, not uh, put a big pressure because. Uh, uh, at the age, uh, age of our patient, a lot of uh, uh, patients can have a positive 
uh, have massage if you give a big pressure. So it should be physiologic and it should uh, provoke the same symptoms for the patient. If you have a pause, even if it's significant, but without uh, any symptoms, it, uh, it's, uh, it can be negative. It can be considered as negative. And you should do it in uh, a standing position also, because you can have significant pause or sometimes significant hypotension because of vasodilatation. So if you can try the carotid sinus massage, try it in standing position. Usually what we do it we, when we do the tilt test, when we fix the patient and the tilt uh, test is in the upright position, we try to do the carotid uh, massage before beginning the tilt table test to be able to document any significant symptoms, uh, pauses or uh, significant hypertension. The AV conduction problem divided into uh, three degrees. First degree, second, and third degree. Usually, first degree usually is asymptomatic. Every P wave is uh, followed by a QRS, but with certain delay, and it's rarely symptomatic. The second degree AV block is divided into Mobitz 1 and Mobitz 2, and you have from time to time a failure of impulse conduction from the atrium to the ventricle. And the third degree, you have a complete dissociation between the atrium and the ventricle. Examples here, the first EKG, the first strip, it's a, pro a simple prolongation of the PR interval, but every P is followed by a QRS but with a uh, PR longer than 200 milliseconds or one big square. The second strip, you can see from the beginning a progressive prolongation of the PR interval before the blocked P wave. This is the Mobitz one. And also this is considered benign because most of the time the, the problem is at the level of the AV node. And the third one, you will see a blocked P wave without prior prolongation of the PR interval. So this is the dangerous form, the Mobitz 2, uh, second degree Mobitz 2. And usually this is an indication for the implantation of a pacemaker, like you will see in the guidelines. And the third one, the complete AV block, you will have complete dissociation between the P and the QRS. So you will see the P waves fast P wave at a certain rate, here it's about 100, and then the escape. So no conduction, but an escape coming from the ventricle. If the escape is coming distal after the bifurcation of the branches, the escape will, uh, will give you a wide QRS and it will be slower. If it's before the bifurcation, it will give you a narrow QRS or what we call a junctional escape rhythm. And usually it's uh, uh, faster, narrow QRS and much well tolerated uh, than the wide QRS, but both are dangerous and uh, it is an indication for uh, implantation of a pacemaker if you don't have a reversible cause, of course. So now you have our patient coming for syncope, how you will do the risk stratification? In the interrogation, then in the physical exam, then in the uh, EKG and other tools that you, you can use, and then how you will manage this patient. It's considered low risk if the syncope is associated with prodrome, it, uh, typical of reflex syncope, lightheadedness, sweating, nausea, vomiting, feeling of warmth, or after sudden, unexpected, unpleasant sight, sound, smell, or pain, after prolonged standing or crowded hot places, during a meal or postprandial, all these are in favor of reflex, uh, uh, syncope, or orthostatic hypotension, triggered by cough, defecation, micturition, with head rotation or pressure on the carotid, like during shaving or tight collars, 
standing from supine sitting position. So all these in the interrogation are in favor of benign cause of syncope. The, the high risk in the interrogation, the major, if your patient had a sudden onset of chest discomfort, discomfort, dyspnea, abdominal pain, headache, if you have the syncope during exertion or when supine, if you have a sudden onset of palpitation immediately followed by syncope, those are considered major uh, risk factors in the interrogation. Minor, <clears throat> but also considered high risk if associated with structural heart disease. If you have no warning symptoms or short prodrome less than 10 seconds before the syncope, if you have a family history on, uh, of sudden cardiac death at young age, and it's a major risk if you have structural heart disease or abnormal EKG in this condition, or if you have syncope in the sitting position. Now, in the interrogation, also you should ask about the past medical history. If the syncope, if your patient has a long history of recurrent episode of syncope with low risk features with the same characteristics of the current episodes, this is, this is considered as a low risk. <clears throat> if your patient has no structural heart disease, it's considered as a low risk. Major risk, if you have severe structural or coronary artery disease like heart failure, low ejection fraction, or previous myocardial infarction. So all these should be inclu included in your interrogation of this, our patient of 70 years old. Now we'll pass to the physical exam. If you have a normal examination, it's reassuring. If you have unexplained systolic blood pressure at the emergency department less than 90, it's considered one of uh, the risk factors. If you have a suggestion of gastrointestinal bleeding and signs of hypovolemia as a cause of syncope, it, it's a risk. If you have a persistent bradycardia less than 40 in awake state and your patient is not an athlete in the absence of physical training, of course. Or if you have a significant systolic murmur during auscultation. So all these should be included. Next, we'll pass to the EKG. If you have a normal EKG, this is a this is reassuring. It's a, a low risk patient. If you have EKG changes consistent with ischemia or with acute ischemia, like ST elevation or depression with syncope, if you have a Mobitz two second degree AV block or third degree AV block, if you have a slow atrial fibrillation less than 40, persistent sinus bradycardia bundle branch block or intraventricular conduction disturbances, Q waves consistent with NMI or cardiomyopathy, sustained or non-sustained VTAC, dysfunction of a pacemaker or an ICD. If you have, the patient has spontaneous type one Brugada pattern, if he has a long QT with syncope, all these should be considered as a high risk patient. Other minor high-risk patients, Mobitz 1, second degree AV block and first degree AV block with markedly prolonged PR interval, only if the history is suggestive of arrhythmic syncope in this condition. If you have borderline heart rate 40 to 50 or slow AFib 40 to 50, uh, the ventricle. If you have paroxysmal SVT or atrial fibrillation, pre-excited QRS, short QT interval, atypical Brugada patterns, type two or three, or negative T waves suggestive of arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. So we can have a lot of information from the EKG. So when you say negative T waves, yeah. particularly you mean negative T waves? For the uh, ARVC, uh, at the right lead, so V1, V2, V3 mainly, and if you say, see other patterns like the epsilon waves, which is not uh, that frequent, and if the syncope in the interrogation is at exertion also, or directly after the exertion, this is in favor. Also, you should do the interrogation to see if it's, uh, like we said, if it's a chronic condition, repetitive, or it's a new onset. So all these should be considered during your evaluation. 
but uh, I'm sure I'm stuck on this same uh, issue. A negative T wave up to V3 in uh, female is considered one of those normal features. So I'm yeah. to pay attention to this. Uh, uh, it's tricky sometimes, especially if you have a pattern of right bundle that can explain the negative T wave. Uh, so it's not always easy to differentiate. Uh, but if the T wave is, uh, is a slight T wave, it's something. Or if it's a deep T wave, it's another thing. So it depends on the uh, morphology of the EKG. Uh, and sometimes it's borderline. You know, you can have all these with the normal EKG also. Uh, there is one thing, when you see period inversion in female, it's usually just probably, usually most common above the age of 40. And these groups yeah. are usually younger. And as you said, the deeper T would make some sense. Yeah, exactly. Black and white. Yeah, exactly. So we'll divide after the interrogation and the physical exam and the EKG our patients to three categories according to the guidelines low risk low risk features borderline or high risk if your patient has low risk features there's no need to admit to the hospital it's probably reflex or situational syncope or orthostatic hypotension and you can discharge that patient from the er and evaluate as outpatient to see if you can uh, do the investigation as outpatient. If it's borderline, you can, uh, if you have a what we call a uh, syncope unit, you can admit to a syncope unit. If no, you can admit your patient for investigation. And if you have a high-risk patient, usually he should be admitted uh, to be able to make the appropriate uh, diagnosis for him. So. Like we said, if you have, uh, those are the recommendations. So, if you have, uh, what's in favor of uh, cardiac syncope? If you have arrhythmic syncope, it's highly probable when the EKG shows persistent sinus bradycardia or sinus poses more than three seconds in awake state and in the absence of physical training, mobits two second degree or third degree AV block, alternating left and right bundle branch block, VT or rapid paroxysmal SVT, non-sustained VTAC and long or short QT interval, pacemaker or RCD malfunction with cardiac poses. So if you have any, any of these on the EKG, the most probable uh, uh, diagnosis is cardiac cause of a syncope. Also, cardiac ischemia, related syncope is confirmed when syncope presents with evidence of acute myocardial ischemia with or without myocardial infarction. Syncope due to structural cardiopulmonary disorders is highly probable with, uh, with syncope present in patients with prolapsing atrial myxoma, left atrial ball thrombus, severe aortic stenosis, pulmonary embolism, or aortic dissection. Now, we can do other tests, like we said. First, Carotid sinus massage, like we said, it is indicated in patients more than 40 years of age with syncope of unknown origin compatible with a reflex mechanism. It's considered a class one recommendation. The diagnostic criteria, when we say if it's positive, is confirmed if the massage causes bradycardia or asystole and or hypotension that reproduce spontaneous symptoms and patients have clinical features compatible with a reflex mechanism of syncope. So it should be like a reflex mechanism in the interrogation, and it should be positive uh, um, uh, carotid sinus massage, and it, sh it should reproduce the same symptoms like we said before. And it should be physiologic, so uh, be gentle with your patient. Also, we can be helped by the tilt table testing. The indication for tilt ta testing, it should be considered in patients suspected reflex syncope, orthostatic hypotension, or postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, or psychogenic. Also to educate patients to recognize symptoms and learn physical maneuvers. The diagnostic criteria, 
should be likely as a reflex, uh, reflex syncope if tilt testing reproduces symptoms along with the characteristic circulatory pattern of these conditions. We know that we can have multiple uh, reactions to tilt table testing. It can be ma mainly cardioinhibitory with significant pause or mainly uh, vasodepressor uh, without significant pause but, but with significant uh, hypotension and uh, uh, syncope or it can be mixed most of the time it's it's a mixed with the uh, at the same time bradycardia with or without significant pauses or asystole uh, with hypotension also a tool that uh, we can use for the evaluation of syncope is the ekg monitoring the indication immediate in hospital Monitoring is indicated in high-risk patients, of course, like we said. Halter can be used also, should be considered in patients who have frequent syncope or pre-syncope. So it should be frequent episodes to be able to, uh, to document it <coughs> with the Halter monitoring. We can put it for 24, 48 uh, or more. Then you have the external loop recorder should be considered early after the index event in patients who have an intersymptom interval less than one month. So it can be also used. Then you have the implantable uh, loop recorder also that can be used in early, fa early phase of evaluation in patients with recurrent syncope of uncertain origin in the absence of high risk criteria and high likelihood of recurrence within the battery life of the device. Also, it should be considered in patients with suspected or certain reflex syncope presenting with frequent or severe syncopal episodes. If, even if we are thinking that it can be a reflex, but it's severe symptoms and uh, recurrent symptoms, we can implant the uh, loop recorder. May be considered also for patients with in whom epilepsy was suspected, but the treatment has proven ineffective. So it's a false diagnosis of epileptic crisis and may be considered in patients with unexplained falls. Also falls can be uh, secondary to syncope. <clears throat> the recommendation also as diagnostic criteria, so if you implant the loop recorder, what's diagnostic for cardiac cause of syncope? Arrhythmic uh, syncope is confirmed when a correlation between syncope and the arrhythmia, bradycardia or tachycardia is detected. Okay, so it's very important when you have a uh, recording of uh, an episode of uh, bradycardia to see if it's symptomatic or not. So you ask your patient, did you feel anything during that uh, minute or that hour? In the absence of syncope, arrhythmic syncope should be considered likely when periods of mobits to second degree or third degree AV block or a ventricular pause more than three seconds with possible exception of young trained person during sleep or rate control atrial fibrillation, or rapid prolonged paroxysmal SVT or VT are detected. So even if the patient is asymptomatic but with episodes of paroxysmal mobits 2 or complete AV block or significant pauses, unless it's during the night or your patient is an athlete, in this condition it can be considered as physiologic, so in uh, those other conditions, it is an indication for implantation of devices because your syncope is secondary to arrhythmic cause. I will give you uh, the example of this uh, recording. So you will see this EKG, hopefully, okay. So you have the recording here of a bradycardia and a significant pause secondary to uh, to AV block, okay? And of course, our patient here had an episode of syncope. So this is a significant pause and significant uh, AV block, high degree AV block. But if you look here, it is debatable here if the cause is it secondary to AV block or is it secondary to uh, vasovagal syncope, of course. Yeah. Why? Because if you look at your recording at the beginning, you will see the progressive bradycardia. And then you will see the pause. First, you will have a sinus pause without P wave, and then you will have blocked P wave. 
when we do tilt table testing for uh, vasovagal syncope, we have a lot of time, an AV block and pause, and uh, pauses more than 10 seconds, and we don't impl implant a device in this condition. We will see the guidelines, but what it will tell us when we implant in the vasovagal syncope with significant uh, pauses. That's a very important point. So what to look for is basically this prolongation of the P2P interval before exactly. the patient goes into heart block. This tells you this is secondary to a high vagal tone or uh, what have you. Exactly. So bradycardia before pause, should be, you should be alerted that it can be vasovagal syncope with significant uh, asystole here. Then what we can do, what we have other tools, we can do an EP study for syncope. The recommendations, mm -hmm. the ASC 2018 recommendations for uh, EP study, it is recommended in patients with uh, syncope and previous myocardial infarction or other scar-related conditions. In this condition, you, you, you're looking for ventricular arrhythmia. Also in patients with syncope and bifascicular block, bundle branch block. EP study should be considered when syncope remains unexplained after non-invasive evaluation. So it's a class 2A recommendation by fascicular block with syncope. You can do a, uh, an EP study. So if I might stop you here, if a patient, uh, an older individual with bifascicular block, and let's say first degree AV block comes in with recurrent syncopes, halter, everything else is normal. Was that an indication for a pacemaker implantation? For pacemaker implantation? First degree AV block? No, first degree with bifascicular block. What is what is uh, called <coughs> trifascicular block? Yeah. Uh, it is an indication. It's a class 2B indication. But you can do the AP study and document the prolongation of the, the HV interval, and it will be a 2A indication. Yeah. So it can be. Uh, also, it's also mentioned in the recommendations. In patients with syncope and asymptomatic sinus bradycardia, EP study may be considered in a few instances when non-invasive tests have failed to show a correlation between syncope and bradycardia. Also, EP study can be considered in patients with syncope preceded by sudden and brief palpitations. EP study may be considered when syncope remains unexplained after non-invasive evaluation. In this condition, uh, search also for ventricular tachycardia. Now, if you, you've done the, uh, you did the EP study, what is considered positive? In patients with unexplained syncope and bifascular block, a pacemaker is indicated in the presence of either a baseline HV interval more than 70 milliseconds, or second or third degree Hispirkinji block during incremental atrial pacing or with pharmacological challenge. So in this condition, you implant. Also in patients with unexplained syncope and previous myocardial infarction, it's recommended to manage induction of to, to be able to document sustained monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. Also in patients with without structural heart disease with syncope preceded by sudden and brief palpitation, it's recommended to manage the induction of SVT or VTAC and treat appropriate, appropriately according to the conditions. If it can be ablated, normal heart, abnormal heart. And then 2A in patients with syncope and asymptomatic sinus bradycardia, a pacemaker should be considered if the, a prolonged corrected sinus node recovery time is present. So also, in this case, it's secondary to sinus, no to sinus node disease and not AV node disease. Also, cardiac pacing is indicated when there is a, an established relation between syncope and symptomatic bradycardia due to sick sinus syndrome or intrinsic AV block. So if you have uh, symptomatic bradycardia or sick sinus syndrome with symptoms, it is indicated. Indicated also, when you have intermittent paroxysmal intrinsic third or second degree AV block, even if there is no uh, documentation of correlation with symptoms. So for sinus node, class one should be correlated. AV block, second, uh, MOBITS two or three, uh, uh, even without correlation with symptoms. Also considered in uh, 
pacing should be considered when the relation between syncope and asymptomatic sinus node dysfunction is less established. Is not indicated in patients when there are reversible causes of bradycardia. In bifascicular block, cardiac pacing is indicated in patients with syncope by a bifascicular block and a positive epi study or the implantable rule loop recorder documented AV block. This is class one. 2B, if you, have, if you want to implant without doing investigations like we said. So this is the summary of the indications. Symptomatic uh, sinus node dysfunction, it's class one. Asymptomatic sinus node dysfunction, 2A. Second or third degree AV block, even without correlation with symptoms, it's uh, class one. Uh, if you have bifascicular block with positive EP study or implantable rule loop recorder, class one if without doing those investigations, class 2B. And this is my last slide, when it's indicated to implant a uh, pacemaker in vasovagal syncope. So, if you have a severe, recurrent, unpredictable syncope, and age more than 40, you can consider a pacemaker. If no, pacing is not indicated. If you have this recurrent and your patient is more than 40 years and you do the carotid sinus massage, it is indicated, if it's positive, it is indicated to implant a pacemaker. If the, the tilt test is positive also, you should consider helping with the hypotensive secondary to vasodilatation also. If the carotid sinus massage is negative, you do the tilt table test. If you have asystole with the tilt table test, you can implant a device and help with other things to, uh, for the hypotension sec secondary to vasodilatation. If you don't have a, a uh, an asystole on the tilt table test, you, Im you can implant the uh, recorder, the implantable loop recorder. If you have asystole with the implantable loop recorder, like we saw with uh, our patient, so our EKG, we saw with bradycardia and significant uh, pauses, if he's more than 40 years old, even if we know that it's vasovagal, if he's more than 40 years old, very symptomatic, very frequent, we can consider implanting uh, the pacemaker. And usually we implant uh, a dual chamber pacemaker. It's better than the single chamber uh, with the feature that you can accelerate the, the atrial pacing whenever you have uh, 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 bradycardia. So uh, sudden bradycardia, your pacemaker will fire it at a faster rate to try to avoid uh, the syncope. Thank you. Thank Great. You. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Abboud, uh, for the, this valuable uh, lecture. I'm just going to convey some questions that the audience uh, uh, are asking. Uh, one of the questions is, uh, how do you evaluate patients with uh, severe uh, Barlow disease and uh, mitral annular disjunction? How do you risk certify those patients? You know, these are at elevated risk of sudden death. Um, the, the mitral prolapse, severe mitral prolapse, uh, it's it's debatable how much it can cause sudden death because we have some studies that uh, that uh, that are positive and others that are uh, negative. So if you have only uh, mitral valve prolapse uh, with the syncope, you should you should do more investigations to be able to document uh, arrhythmia. So for me, it's not. Uh, by itself an indication. Great. The other question is about uh, short QT syndrome. Uh, what is it considered uh, short and how frequently do we see this condition? Also, it's, uh, it's relatively new. Uh, it's a new entity. It's very rare uh, if, because we, we see all the time short QT interval. Uh, if you have a syncope, but typically, it's not vasovagal, it's not reflex, and you you uh, you have this short QT interval. Uh, for me, I will uh, implant, for example, for example, a, a loop recorder to be able to document some arrhythmias. 
so it doesn't alarm you as much as a syncope in someone who has a long QT syndrome. No, no. Great. All right. Any other questions from the panel? No, but uh, just uh, one comment. <laughs> we have indications, some indications of loop recorders, but in Lebanon, because of the financial problems, yeah. that's why it's not really... <laughs> It's uh, as expensive as the pacemaker. As the pacemaker, yeah. that's so why. Sometimes it's easier to implant the, the pacemaker. Yeah, uh, well, and it's not covered. Out. This is one of the main problem. Yeah. Yeah. And there is a, definitely a role for EP studies for, for in some uh, some cases. Exactly. So the EP study, <coughs> you look for the sinus node recovery time for yeah. the sinus node. Well, assess the sinus and the AV node. And the AV node the conduction. If you create a uh, an AV block below the, the HIS, yeah. uh, you're sure that... Uh, there's an indication for a pacemaker. Thank you. Thank you. Great. So we will uh, break for two minutes to uh, for Dr. Khoury to be on the podium and give us his lecture. All right. So we are back. Uh, thanks for uh, staying with us. We will continue with the second uh, speaker and the second session about uh, basically devices and uh, heart failure. We'll try to make this as interactive as possible. Dr. Khoury. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, today, will be discussing the non-surgical device treatment of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. If you look at the first patient, or the patient that we'll be discussing, he is a 65-year-old male patient with shortness of breath on minimal exertion, referred from his physician for evaluation. He's an ex-smoker, moderate alcohol consumption, is a known case of dilated cardiomyopathy. His coronary angio is normal, and he is in New York Heart Association Class 3. His medication, he is on a full GDMT, guidelines mediated therapy, mainly ACE inhibitor, beta blocker, aspirin, amiodarone, Aldactone and Lasix. What about his clinical evaluation? In his clinical evaluation, his blood pressure was around 100 over 60 with a heart rate of 80. His cardiomegaly by chest X-ray. His ECG revealed a left bundle branch block with a QRS of 222 and the first degree. His echocardiography had a left ventricular ejection fraction of 25% with a grade three mitral rigor, blood test with a normal range. So this patient was referred to you and came to your clinic and you want to evaluate and see what can you give him better than this medication that his primary physician started. You see here on the slide, the ECG. And as you see, it's a very wide left bundle. So this is a left bundle branch block with a first degree AV block. So you, whenever you are looking at this patient, you have to see where he stands in the heart failure progression. So if you look carefully, you see that this patient went through several stages of the heart failure progressive disease. He went from stage A with the high risk with no symptoms to structural to stage C, but there is one important point where he reached the left bundle branch block. And you know, in the setup and the treatment in progressive heart disease, when you see the left bundle branch block, this is where cardiac resynchronization therapy will play a big role. Why cardiac resynchronization therapy play a role in this? Because we have to remember one thing, is the prevalence of the inter and intraventricular conduction delay in heart failure population. In general heart failure population, intraventricular conduction delay is around 15%, but as you move to moderate and severe, it goes above 30%. So a big chunk of this population have a bundle branch block. What are the problem in the heart failure population who have a bundle branch block? especially the left bundle branch block. You remember very well from the basics of electrocardiography that septal depolarization starts from left to right, except in the left bundle, where it's reversed from right to left. 
And what you are seeing here, and you are seeing that the patient with left bundle branch block have a lot of asynchrony. One, atrioventricular. Two, intraventricular within, within the ventricle itself and interventricular between the two ventricles, the right and the left. There is a lot of dyssynchrony between the two. And when you have so much dyssynchrony, you will have delayed in the AV sequence, you will have mitral regurg, and you have also, and it's very important, decrease in filling time. So these are the most important effects of the left bundle. In addition to this, you will have more abnormality that we said interventricular delays, where you have abnormal RV to LV sequence, intraventricular activation sequence, and the non-uniform mole strain. So these are the important mechanical effect of the left bundle. What about the left bundle and the mortality? And this is a very interesting point. This is a very old study published in Jack in 1999, and it's called the VEST study analysis. And looking at it, you see that as your QRS complex gets wider, the mortality will increase. And you see that when you reach above to 20 as our patient, the mortality is really high. So one, the patient has a left bundle that affects his mortality and the mechanics of his heart. Another important point is the ejection fraction. So this patient has a low ejection fraction. And when you have a low ejection fraction, you have to remember a very important relation between the sudden cardiac uh, arrest and reduced the LV ejection fraction. We know that low ejection fraction is still the single most important risk factor for overall mortality and sudden cardiac death. <coughs> Except when the heart failure will progress to class four and very advanced pump failure become more important. And this is, will be discussed in the coming few slides. So you have our patient, he has a left bundle, low ejection fraction, and we have to do something. He, he now went into the criteria of the CRTD. What are the criteria that we have to remember very well, especially after the, the famous meta-analysis that was published in 2011 and 12 about patients who respond and don't respond in CRTD? The most important thing to remember, a left bundle branch block with a QRS more than 150 is a, a 1A recommendation. If you don't have a left bundle, we know everybody will be asking, what about the right bundle? When we said the problem is the delay in the left ventricle, and the right bundle will not cause a delay. But if you have an intraventricular conduction delay, a right bundle with a left anterior hemi block and all this, we can consider them as a 2AB recommendation if the QRS is more than 150. So the duration of the QRS is really important. 130 to 149 can be considered in some patients who are really resistant to medical therapy. So what will be your approach? Your approach is you are trying to reach the posterior lateral wall. If I may stop you here, Dr. Khoury. Sure. I'm sorry to interrupt you, my boss. Sure. Uh, you have said uh, very well that you move on to device therapy and heart failures, meaning implanting a CRT after you have achieved a good optimal maximum Guide, yeah, guidelines, guidelines medical therapy. GDMT. What do you mean by GDMT? GDMT is you have to use all the, the medication that was recommended in heart failure management. All right. From ACE, from luminary corticoid, beta blockers, very important, are the standard now. And then I will be discussing later on about the new medication that we use in heart failure. So the patient should be really, really well treated. So if you see the patient not, not having all this medication, we, we don't go for CRPD. We try to optimize his medical therapy. If he doesn't improve within the first three months, we consider G we, uh, the CRT. So my... Uh, directly to the question, do you stop at ACE and beta blockers or do you, do you consider optimal medical therapy in 2020 is the newer 
medications like uh, yeah, yeah, Entresto yeah, yeah, and Evabradine yeah. and all yeah, these things. I will show you in the end. I will be discussing a little bit what we discuss the GDMT, especially in this population. Dr. Khouri, uh, yes. the, the optimal therapy tol tolerated by tolerated your patient by because patient. sometimes you are unable to, to, yeah. uh, to put the ACE important. or... Yeah. Uh, and very important for the audience, whenever you use optical medical therapy, you have to keep increasing the dose till you reach your goal. Exactly. It's not only, and we started the patient, we leave him for six months, we don't see him. This is very important. So, <clears throat> in this patient, you have to try to reach most, most importantly to the posterior lateral wall. And this can be achieved from the left side, from, uh, to the left side, and this can be achieved through the coronal sinus. And as you know, most of you, that the posterior lateral branch should be around what you call it the three o'clock. And the three o'clock is <coughs> nothing but, there's delays. And the three o'clock is usually between the lateral veins, you see it now as a red uh, uh, cross. And this is where your lead should be there. <coughs> Now, how can you reach it there by the cor and through the coronary sinus? Very simple. So you can use, as we said, a CS lead. It could be a unipolar, where you have only one uh, electrode. It could be a bipolar, which where you have two. And now, most of the time, we are using the quadripolar electrodes. So you can have the unipolar, as you see it here, the bipolars here, and now you can see the quadripolar electrodes. Okay, so this is here as a, our patient. You can see that we did an injection, and this is your posterior lateral branch here, and you put the lead, and then we look at the after putting the lead and making sure everything is fine. We have to look at the ECG post, and the most important thing to remember is one, if you have in a good position, you should have narrowing of the QRS complex, as we see here, as compared to the left bundle we started with in the beginning. You remember it was very wide. Here the QRS is around is less than the QRS that we saw before. And at the same time, if you are really in the posterior lateral branch, you have to have a superior axis of the ECG with a positive R in V1. It's not there here, but this is a very simple thing to look at the EKG whenever you are following your patient. Now, a very ch the challenging, and everybody discusses it, that when to use an ICD and when to use a CRTD in a patient who is at risk of sudden <coughs> cardiac death and low ejection fraction. And if you look at the MEDIT criteria that favors CRTD, you see that all left bundle branch block patient should receive a CRTD, whereas the non-left bundle branch block that are on the right of the unity line favoring the ICD. So this is the first question answered in a patient when he comes to your clinic and with a heart failure and you want to help him with a device that how to decide if it's CRTD or no. All what we do, we do a quick ECG, have left bundle more than 150 is indicated. And we have to remember one thing, and it's very important whenever we are seeing patients in the clinic to decide on a further management, a famous the guidelines saying that CRT is contraindicated in patients with the QRS of below 130 milliseconds. And this is very important whenever we see the patient, we'll explain to him that you are not fit and this will not help you. So again, this is, uh, in my mind, this is an important, very important point because we get asked quite a bit, will this extra lead harm the patient? Yes, if it's below 130, yes. Great. Sure. And you know, and me and you, we have several cases. We have more VTs than before when we put it. Another important thing I like the audience to remember, and it's very important is the indication of ICD. We are getting some referrals a little bit tricky. When we say ICD implantation, we have to remember, especially post-MI, that within the first 40 days post-MI is contraindicated to put an ICD. So it is a 3A recommendation. 
And ICD therapy is not recommended in patient with New York Heart Class 4 severe symptoms refractory to pharmacological therapy unless they are candidate for more advanced technology. CRT, left ventricular assist device, or cardiac transplant. So these are two contraindicated. Please remember them very well. <laughs> now I will move a little bit further to, to, the, to the doctors who sometimes they have a patient with CRTD, is not followed up by an electrophysiologist, but there is somebody from the company, a technical support. You have to remember one thing, that the goal should be that the biventricular pacing should be continuous reaching up to 100%. Above 93% is acceptable. Otherwise, the biventricular or CRTD will not deliver what it, it was asked to do. So it will not improve the LV function. Apical position of the left ventricular lead should be avoided. This is us. This is technical for us. And always we have to target the posterior lateral or the latest activation. Another question that always we hear about it and always we discuss in meetings is when do you use CRTD and when do you use CRTP? If you look at the mortality reduction, maybe CRTD is better than CRTP, but the complication and the cost is much higher. So when do you use CRTP? We use it in advanced heart failure, severe renal insufficiency, a lot of comorbidities, frailty, and cachectic. So patients, we are trying to help them, but we have to remember that the one, whenever you have more than one year expectancy, stable heart failure, ischemic especially, any ischemic heart disease, and lack of comorbidity, CRTD, will come as a very important part of the management. So in general, at the end, the message that you should be considered, the CRT should could be considered because it reduces morbidity, it prolongs survival, improves symptoms and quality of life, improves cardiac function and efficiency. These benefits are, as Bernard asked before, in addition to the GDMT, the Guidelines Directed Medical Therapy, which is part, a very important part of the management of heart failure. When we say Guidelines Direct Medical Therapy, I like to introduce a new and a very interesting concept that start to be on the guidelines now, mainly on the 2016 ESC guidelines. So before we move to that, there is an interesting question from the audience about non-responders. Yeah. You know, uh, about 70% of patients are responders, but when is it indicated to turn off the LV lead, or is it indicated to turn off the LV lead for non-responders? When we have a non-responder, the most important thing is to go into the details. Where is the LV lead? Was it in a target vein? Is a good position or no? Was it put somewhere else? It was an indication. The QRS, what, uh, what happened to QRS pre and post? We have to check it out. It's not an issue of putting it off or on. But if you want a non-responder, I think it's better to put the right more than the left off. Is the left is a good position? If the left is not in good position, yes, you should put it off or try to put a new lead. And how often do you uh, send your patient or do you perform optimization of AV or VV delay for your patients? Now, with the new machine, with all the companies that we use, they have an automatic system, which is acceptable. Doing an echo, it's really time-consuming and does not work most of the time. Yeah, this is the question that I want to ask. What's the role of the echo before and after CRT? And this is, we hear it frequently. Yeah, and uh, what I do, I do an echo before and ask the group that I'm interested in putting CRTD, so they look for the dyssynchrony and make sure there's a problem. Post-CRTD, we see about follow-up mainly about ejection fraction. No. And most of the time, when you get the good position, the good indication, most of them, they do well. Uh, if you have a borderline QRS, do you look on the echo for yes. the synchrony? Yes, the 130, 149, the echo will give you a good idea. Well, only I, I don't take 130, 149 without an echo. Wait, detailed echo, deciding. Mm. I send them saying, I want to put CRTD, give me your opinion. Okay. Thank you. Thank Great. You. Thank you, everyone, uh, for attending Thank this uh, second uh, session. I hope uh, you benefited from uh, the discussion. Thank you.